What we picked up from the ranch was extraordinary. It was metal that could not be bent. There were other pieces of metal that you would crunch it up like tinfoil, and then it would magically sort of reform its original shape, and it was not of this earth. The witnesses said that they saw three-foot-tall bodies and that they saw them in relation to what appeared to be an alien spacecraft. When he was up there, he spotted some objects, bright flashing lights that caught his eye, uh, nine of them, as he recalled. And what he said was, is that they were moving and behaving very oddly, very erratically. He did not, they did not make sense. Army officer, Air Force officer Clifford Stone, he says that he actually saw the footage of the so-called Roswell crash. Hi, my name is Mike Barra. I'm an author and a former aerospace engineer. I've been studying aliens and UFOs and extraterrestrial civilizations for more than 25 years. And I'm the author of about eight or nine books on the subject now. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is a subject that I find very interesting, which is the original sort of seminal event in the UFO lore that we've all come to know and love, and that is the Roswell crash and the Kenneth Arnold sighting. Most people don't realize that these two events took place actually only two weeks apart, and they started what you might call the late 1940s flying saucer craze that worked its way all the way through the 1950s and on into the 1960s until it kind of quieted down when man started exploring the moon and doing some other things in space. Now, it's really interesting to me that this Roswell mythology has developed over the years. There's been a lot of witnesses, a lot of people that have made a lot of claims. But what I wonder and what I've been interested in for a long, long time is whether or not this might all have been a case of mistaken identity. So today we're going to examine that possibility and decide whether or not we think in the end the Roswell incident was actually a crash of an alien spacecraft, a UFO, or was it a weather balloon, or was it something else entirely? Now, the whole story begins, actually, on June 24th, 1947, when a pilot named Kenneth Arnold, who lived in Idaho, was flying around the area of Mount Rainier, Washington, in the state of Washington. He was an experienced pilot. He was actually out looking for the crash of a cargo plane that was reported to be in the area around Mount Rainier. He, uh, when he was up there, he spotted some objects, bright flashing lights that caught his eye, uh, nine of them, as he recalled. And what he said was, is that they were moving and behaving very oddly, very erratically. He did not, they did not make sense. The rubus did not make sense to him. So, when he came back, he landed, he reported this to local authorities, and somehow, by the time he had actually touched the ground, the story had hit the newspapers. He radioed in, he made a few uh, inquiries about what they might be, and then his descriptions went into the newspapers, and of course, as we all know, once something hits the media, it becomes an entirely different story. Well. Uh, right away, there were stories all over the United States. They went over the news, uh, news wires, like uh, here's the Chicago Sun reporting on it in uh, on June 25th, talking about supersonic flying saucers that were sighted by an Idaho pilot. So that term, flying saucers, is actually pretty interesting because in reality, they weren't saucers at all. This is a copy of a hand-typed report by Kenneth Arnold with some handwritten notes that described the objects that he saw. And what he saw were very thin sort of airfoil type type structures or formations that looked more like a wedge than they did like what you might call a flying saucer. So it's pretty interesting as he went through the discussion and described their bouncing motion, their sort of erratic skipping motion, that the term flying saucer was coined. Now, as you get deeper into the descriptions, Arnold actually worked with an artist to reproduce in a more close definition uh, what he really thought he had seen. And what he saw was something like this. Here is Kenneth Arnold with a picture of an object created by an artist that he says is the nine objects, one of the nine objects that he saw that day. Now, interestingly, it bears um, a strong resemblance to objects that were being sighted all over the United States at that time. This is a photograph from a sighting in Phoenix, Arizona of objects that aerospace engineers would probably describe to you today as a lifting body. Those are experimental aircraft that were very popular in the 1950s and the 1960s 
that created lift without actually having wings. And it was a very interesting study and a very interesting phenomenon. But that's kind of what these objects look like. And if you keep in mind that military technology is always 20 years ahead of civilian publicly available technology, then NASA's experiments with lifting bodies would have probably started back in the 1940s, which is, gosh, right around the time Kenneth Arnold had his sighting. Here's uh, another close-up of the artist rendition from The Coming of the Saucers, which is a book that he wrote along with a guy named Ray Palmer in 1952, where he described it as more of a boomerang-shaped object, but with a dome, some sort of glass dome, on the top of the airfoil. And again, this does not make sense, really, from an engineering standpoint. At least it didn't in 1947 or 1952. It's interesting because it looks a lot like the body shape of the Martian war machines from the 1953 film, The War of the Worlds. Now, is this really relevant or important? Well, it might be because The War of the Worlds might have been inspired in some sense by Kenneth Arnold's sighting. People in Hollywood are pretty smart. They look at the newspapers, they see all this stuff, and they're very, very well aware of what uh, is happening in the news media. So I don't think it's a coincidence that these objects that were used, the Martian war machines, actually looked a lot like Kenneth Arnold's wedge-shaped object. Those were reused, modified a little bit, and reused for the famous movie Robinson Crusoe on Mars, which is a weird movie. Now, why is this important? I think it's important because they have the same sort of boomerang wedge shape and they have the glowing dome which was not a thing when Kenneth Arnold made his artist rendering in the early 1950s, late 1940s. So again, this is very similar to what Arnold had created or what he said he saw. And it's funny because as he went through this, he was completely unaware of something else that might be possible. Another object that this could describe. This is Kenneth Arnold's quote, flying saucer. And this is a German flying wing aircraft called the Horton H0229. It had other names, but that was its primary designation in Nazi Germany. Now, the H0229 is interesting. It was a flying wing aircraft. It had jet engines, and uh, it was based on earlier technology that the Germans had developed in World War II. The ME262 was the world's first jet fighter. It was faster than any fighter in the world, and it performed very, very outstandingly during the war. And in fact, as Chuck Yeager put it once, fortunately, Hitler was an idiot because instead of using these fighters to shoot down Allied bombers and give Germany a break from the constant daily bombardment on their industry, their war making industry by the Allies, he insisted it be an offensive weapon. So they they loaded a bomb on and then had to drop, drop a bomb on various Allied cities. But the technology was phenomenal. It was very forward thinking. And the HO-229 was right in that same family. Now, As they ran over Berlin, the Allies, the Americans, captured the factory where the Horton HO-229 was being designed and manufactured. They actually found plans, four different versions, getting bigger and bigger and bigger of this winged fighter-bomber aircraft. It had two very tightly spaced jet engines in the front next to the nose, which is actually kind of a common design. And this is the actual prototype. Well, it's a wood mock-up of the original Horton HO-229. Uh, here's another example from the back of the exhaust of the jet engines and workers, American workers, inspecting it and analyzing the Horton HO-229, which was captured intact. Today, there were a couple of portions of HO-229s that were actually partially built. They still exist. They are in the Smithsonian Museum right now where they are undergoing or have undergone restoration based on the old plans that existed. The plane never flew, but someday uh, it's going to be in the Smithsonian if it is not already in the Air and Space Museum. So these were the plans for the HO-229. And again, it bears, not only does it bear a resemblance a resemblance to uh, Kenneth Arnold's aircraft, but it also bears a resemblance to the, the gimbal video that the, the TTSA folks have been putting out here. And I find that kind of interesting. It looks like it's a flying wing with a distinct tail, it had very stealthy characteristics. Now, of course, we know today that we do have flying wing aircraft. Uh, We have the B-2 stealth bomber, which is the first time we were really able to perfect flying wing, a tailless aircraft that could maneuver and perform at a high level and um, bombing runs. The only thing that made that technology possible, flying wing, is what's called fly-by-wire technology, where a pilot or an autopilot makes an input 
to the control surfaces, the wings, the flaps, the ailerons, and maneuvers the aircraft. Because what happens is, is that doing this, uh, using fly-by-wire technology, the computer is able to adjust, make micro adjustments on uh, a split second uh, basis to keep the aircraft completely stable and moving completely normal and doing exactly what the pilot wants it to do. This did not come into play until the B-2 stealth bomber in the early 1990s. Now, it's interesting when you look back on what Keith, Kenneth Arnold actually said about what he saw. He said they passed directly in front of me at a distance of about 23 miles, which is not very great in the air. I judged their wingspan to be at least 100 feet across. That would be pretty close to winged aircraft like the B-2. And these objects more or less fluttered like they were boats on very rough water. I said they flew like you would take a saucer and throw it across the water. It would skip. Most newspaper men misunderstood and misquoted that. They said, I said they were saucer-like. I said they flew in a saucer-like fashion. So that's where the term flying saucer actually came from. Now, the interesting thing about this from an engineering standpoint, as an airspace engineer, that was my trade back before I got into UFO investigations. The big problem with flying wing designs, we had we had an American flying wing, we had, there were various British attempts to make flying wings work, and until we actually got fly-by-wire technology, none of them worked. The reason none of them worked is because it's an inherently unstable airframe. It tends to sort of wildly jump and spin out of control and do things the pilot does not expect. Now, what's really interesting when I look at this as an aerospace engineer, if you notice the Horton HO229, the canopy, the cockpit, which is going to be a heavy reinforced section of the aircraft, is very, very forward. Now, one of the first things you're going to do in aerospace design to try to stabilize an airframe if it's wild and out of control is you move that center of gravity back more towards the middle of the aircraft. And if you look at Kenneth Arnold's boomerang design, the dome or the cockpit or whatever it was, because remember, he was a long ways away, is moved towards the center. So that beefy section of the aircraft has been moved back. Now, this indicates to me a possibility. I start thinking as an airspace engineer. It's possible that what this actually means is that what he saw are a modified version, an American engineered version of the Horton HO229, which was captured in 1945 and then maybe, maybe, maybe seen again in June of 1947 by Kenneth Arnold. Now, where he had this sighting was around Mount Rainier, Washington, which is the site of McCord Air Force Base. And it's important to understand that back in the 1940s, this area was almost completely uninhabited. I mean, it was sparse. Now there's a couple million people living in Tacoma, Washington, around McCord Air Force Base, but not back then. Back then, there was only a few hundred thousand people living in Seattle, which was 30 or 40 miles to the north, and this place was extremely isolated. So if you think about it, McCord would have been a perfect and very isolated air base from which to test a squadron of experimental flying wing aircraft that the United States was building, developed uh, on German technology. Makes an awful lot of sense that that would be the place that they would actually uh, develop this squadron and do some test flying. The problem with that, of course, is if you look again at this, Kenneth Arnold saw them. Kenneth Arnold saw these aircraft. So that would have probably made people that were testing these things in secret very, very upset. Now, this led to the great UFO flap of 1947. Here's another picture of the sort of lifting body object that was published in uh, in a Phoenix, Arizona newspapers. There were also sightings all over the country, and they looked very, very similar to this very odd wedge-shaped design. There were reports uh, from Chicago. There were reports from Seattle, the Seattle Post Intelligence Service. Here's a, here's a headline, reports pour on, pour in on more flying discs. Witness say eight landed in Idaho. Okay, maybe they went to an air base in Idaho. There were sightings in other parts of the country, the Lubbock Lights in Texas, uh, the Tulsa Daily World. There were all sorts of weird saucers all happening. Notice this is 7-13-47 is the date, meaning just a few weeks after Kenneth Arnold's sighting, just about three weeks. A Cincinnati Inquirer, there were stories of flying saucers over Cincinnati at the same time, July 7th, 1947. And of course, the big one, is Roswell. The Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on a ranch in the Roswell region was 
the headline on July 8, 1947, just two weeks after Kenneth Arnold's sighting. Now, I think that's very significant because it makes a lot of sense. If you thought that McCord Air Force Base was isolated enough to test this squadron of flying wing aircraft that you were trying to develop and trying to exploit this German technology, but it was spotted by this pilot who got all this publicity and went to the newspapers and it got all over the place and was picked up to the point that it started a flying saucer craze all over the country, then it seems to me that the next most isolated place you could think of, a place that was even more remote, that you might want to move this squadron to, would be a place like Roswell, New Mexico, where you had a nuclear bomb strike bomber squadron stationed. It was highly secure. It was even more isolated than McCord Air Force Base. And the chances, anything being seen there, flying around, testing, being picked up at Roswell were almost zero. So only two weeks later, we had this report of a flying saucer that crashed on a ranch in New Mexico. It went all over the place. Here's another one. Um, Army, you know, flying disc found on ranch in New Mexico. And we've all heard the story. Uh, our Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in the Roswell region. It was picked up. And the story was that a flying disc had crashed on this guy, Mac Brazel's ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Now, since then, we've had a lot of reports a lot of additional stories. We've had witnesses come forward. But the story then was, okay, there's a crash flying saucer. And, of course, there were stories that came out subsequently years and years later that there were also alien bodies found. There were people who claimed there were actually two crashes, one on the ranch and one near Corona, New Mexico, which is a bit north of Roswell, New Mexico, and that's where the bodies were found. Interestingly, Army officer, Air Force officer Clifford Stone I interviewed once and a very sweet, very wonderful man was part of what were called crash retrieval scenes. And he says that he actually saw the footage of the so-called Roswell crash. Now, using his testimony as a description, the testers model company created a uh, model kit in the 1990s of the crashed Roswell spacecraft, complete with an interior with alien bodies a bunch of weird stuff uh, that made up the instrument panels and crash damage from the object. But the cool thing about the object, if you look at it, is what Clifford Stone says he saw was very similar to the flying wing design or possibly to the lifting body design that we saw in some of the other photographs. Here's another example of the model kit being made into a diorama. So that stuff's pretty fascinating. But what happened a couple of days later was that General Ramey, uh, Roger Ramey, I believe his name was, who was the head of the Roswell Army Airfield, held a press conference and he emptied the Roswell saucer, as the Roswell Daily Record says. There were headlines again all over the place saying, no, it's not a uh, not a flying saucer. The Army debunks the Roswell flying disc as world simmers with excitement. They basically said the disc is a weather balloon. After the press conference, they even went out and demonstrated some weather balloons and said, oh, this is what the guy saw. This is what he was describing it was nothing more than weather balloon debris. Here's a picture from the actual press conference that was held with uh, two army officers along with General Ramey on the left actually holding, you know, film, mylar, balsa wood sticks, various things that were considered to be so-called parts of the weather balloon. What happened, though, however? is that General Ramey, interestingly, was holding a piece of paper in his hand the entire time. And while the photographs were being taken, he continued to hold this piece of paper. And for years and years and years, nobody knew what was on the piece of paper. Well, Jesse Marcel, who's one of the two officers in those pictures, said years and years later, in 1977, on a TV program called In Search Of, which is narrated by Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek, said, hey, what I handled that day was not what we picked up from the ranch. What we picked up from the ranch was extraordinary. It was metal that could not be bent. There were other pieces of metal that you would crunch it up like tinfoil, and then it would magically sort of reform its original shape. It was couldn't be bent, it couldn't be burned, it couldn't be cut, they couldn't do anything to it, and it was not of this earth. And he says he was ordered by General Ramey and his commanding officers to handle this torn up weather balloon material and explain to everybody that this was all it was. This is what 
had found. That story, by the way, is pretty interesting because when you start looking into the so-called Ramey memo, guess what? Years later, very intrepid researchers started looking at the memo and saying, I think we can discern some of the words on this. This is made from one of the original negatives, photographs that were taken. It's flipped right side up, of course. And the interpretation is pretty interesting. Some of the words that have been found out are have questions at the and the viewing of the decoy you connected to to the Fort Worth at Fort Worth, Texas. On the disc, it says disc that Hout, that would be General Hout, who is a um, uh, one of the top officers at Roswell Army Airfield, sent the A1 M98 advisory being caught. Tower may arrive shortly at Roswell Army Air Force Base. Apparently sent this note that viewers of discs are doing next than you from weather balloons would make and land discovery cruise. Now, this is really interesting because AI, there's chat GPT, is now capable of reading photographs like this and coming up with its own interpretation of what some of the words are. And those aren't that interesting. But some of the other words that we're seeing on there are quite interesting. Here they are. And the victims of the wreck and in the disc, they will ship. Now, that implies that there were victims of the wreck, meaning that maybe some of the reports about alien bodies are true. And in the disc they will ship is absolutely fascinating because what it seems to mean is that there was a, quote, flying disc, which is what they called them back in those days, that was actually recovered at the Roswell Army Airfield and then eventually shipped, obviously, to Hangar 18 in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, interestingly, Marcel's story was later confirmed in the 1990s by Colonel Thomas DuBose. He was the other officer that was pictured with General Ramey with the weather balloon debris. And he says, yeah, that stuff was all fake. It was all phony. It wasn't the real stuff. They brought that in and told us we had to pretend like this is what we found on the ranch. And this is what we sent uh, to Fort Worth and eventually back to Ohio. He says he agrees with, with Marcel that this is not true. This is not, in fact, what they found. Now, Years later, after constant questions about Roswell, about what had happened, whether there was an alien spacecraft crash, the U.S. government uh, issued a report, the Roswell report, where they talked about, well, we think pretty much this was a weather balloon. And what they said was that it was a so-called mobile weather balloon. This is an example of a mobile weather balloon. It was a top secret weather balloon that listened for the sounds of far off nuclear explosions in the stratosphere. They were trying to monitor Soviet nuclear testing using these mogul weather balloons. That's all well and good. That's all fine and dandy. But their explanation therefore was, no, it wasn't a weather balloon. It was a top secret classified weather balloon in other words. And again, nobody bought this. The blowback continued. They continue to get a lot of questions from the mainstream media. I, distinctly, even people like Sam Donaldson of ABC News were very hard on Pentagon public relations officials when they started to present this idea. So three years later, believe it or not, they issued another report, Roswell Report Case Closed. And this time they said, no, it's, it's not just a mobile weather balloon, but we can also account for the bodies that people saw at the press site. Because... After years and years and years of books and testimony from different witnesses, a lot of them claimed, well, we have bodies too. So what they said was, well, the bodies that they saw were actually from something called Operation High Dive, which is where six foot tall human dummies, basically basically crash test dummies, were parachuted, dropped by parachute out of aircraft over the New Mexico desert and landed in the middle of nowhere. And they were supported. They were sent around in what looked like kind of body bags because they did all sorts of testing on them. So the problem with Operation High Dive is that the witnesses said that they saw three foot tall bodies, not six foot tall bodies, and that they saw them in relation to what appeared to be an alien spacecraft, the Roswell incident craft, whatever it was, that happened in 1947. 1953, when Operation High Dive began, is actually six years later. And when, again, reporters pressed the Air Force spokesman at the press conference saying, ah, oh, the case is closed, it's all over with. His answer was, well, you know what? Maybe they were experiencing time compression. That was their explanation for the fact that bodies had been witnessed in 1947, and Operation High Dive didn't begin until 1950.
Nobody bought it. Even Art Bell on the old Coast to Coast AM show mocked the whole thing. Everyone mocked that explanation. But as far as the Air Force is concerned, that's the final explanation for Roswell. So the question then becomes, was this a flying wing aircraft that was sighted by Kenneth Arnold over Washington State? And then later was that squadron transferred to Roswell, New Mexico? And did one of them then crash either on Matt Brazel's ranch or somewhere else? We do have the Ramey memo, which says that there were victims and there was a disc or an object. The truth is, is that the people that might have been printing out those memos, writing those memos up, wouldn't have known anything about a classified secret German technology exploitation program. So here's the one issue that I have with this. If what crashed at Roswell was a flying saucer and not a flying wing aircraft, then everything that we've heard about the Roswell crash, it fits, it makes sense, it's completely logical, it's obviously the truth. The witnesses are telling the truth, Jesse Marcel telling, telling the truth, uh, Thomas DeBose is telling the truth. But if it was a German flying wing experimental aircraft, if they had taken the, or the Horton HO-229 and modified it, updated the design and tried to build them and were testing them first at McCord Air Force Base and then later at Roswell, New Mexico, why didn't the Air Force just say that? Why don't they just come out and say, no, it wasn't a weather balloon. No, it wasn't a mogul top secret listening balloon. It was a German flying wing aircraft that we were trying to perfect, but we couldn't make it work because we didn't have the computer technology to enable it to fly without the skipping crazy motion that Arnold saw and described. So that's what makes me think that it's not actually true, that this explanation is not legitimate, that whatever Kenneth Arnold saw and whatever crashed at Roswell are not simply German flying wing aircraft that the U.S. was experimenting because surely there can't be anything classified about those programs anymore. Unless, of course, there's something so political, politically insidious about those projects, the U.S. government absolutely still to this day doesn't want people to know exactly how involved they were with the Nazis and Nazi technology. So that question to me still hangs up there. We're still trying to decide the truth of it is. If you like this video and you want to see more amazing content, go ahead and check out the next video on our channel.